Okay, in this Halloween theme tutorial, we're going to look at how to make a spooky coffin and how to produce a game ready asset. We first need to start with some reference. Here's a concept I made, a really simple one. Then in Maya, create a box which is 180 centimeters tall. This will be used as reference as that is around about um, a six foot person. Then this pipeline does not include retopologization. That means the base mesh is going to have to be as close to the final asset as we we can make it. So you can see now that I've got the base shape of the coffin and uh, as, as a next step from this base mesh is to take it into ZBrush and start the detailed modeling. I want to make sure that some of the bigger shapes and the, the, the shapes that will show, show up in the silhouette, so any uh, big chips or cracks in the wood is represented in the base mesh as well. If it's not, then it won't bake properly. So have a think about at this stage how you're going to adjust or affect the model in your sculpting stages. Once this is done, it's important that in the sculpting stage you don't make any major changes to the overall shape or silhouette of the um, coffin. Though adjustments still can be made later on, it is just much easier if you have included all the aspects of the model at this point. It saves going back and making changes. Here I'm just modelling in all the extra small pieces, uh, the metal bands and the bolts and nails. Some things like bolts and nails I'll only make one of and I won't bother duplicating them around the model at this stage. Rather I'll wait until the sculpted and textured before I set up the final model. The difference between this base mesh and a base mesh that will only be used to sculpt on and then retopologize is that I'm being very careful to make sure that the topology is neat on this and that there are no engons and um, it's a reasonable amount of polygons as well for the application. Um, whereas a, a, a mesh only used to sculpt on, you don't really need to think about the topology. You're just trying to get something that's a general shape so that you can use it to sculpt the details in. And then later on, you will retopologize it, which is basically just drawing the topology back over the model once the sculpting's finished. So at this point, I thought I'd add a few extra little details to take up some of the space on the texture sheet and this main one being a skull or a skull and a bone. Normally I would produce something like a skull by uh, zbrushing from scratch and then retopologizing because they are a little bit fiddly to, um, to polymodel an organic shape like this. This skull base mesh took around 20 minutes of pushing and pulling until I got a shape that I was happy with and then checking the mesh to make sure that it was low poly enough and um, would would be robust enough to support the details of the sculpt. This isn't probably something I would do for a realistic sculpt but as this is very stylized the base mesh only needed to be very simple, so it, it didn't make much difference to do it this way. Okay, so at this point I'm pretty happy with the bits and pieces I've modelled. Um, so the next thing I do is separate them, uh, explode them out in Maya, so move them away from each other, and then uh, export that out as an OBJ and import that into ZBrush. I then separate these 
meshes onto their own layers and go through each individual um, object, closing all the holes and either dynameshing them or subdividing them, whichever is easiest for that particular asset, so that I have a, a high poly version of each one ready to sculpt upon. You can see here with some of the models that I am simply subdividing, I'm using the crease tool, which you can find in the Z, Z modeler brush to add creases, creases to the edges that I want to remain sharp when subdividing. Um, and then once I've subdivided them up to a certain level, I can then dynamesh them to have the, the desired shape. Now I can begin sculpting in the various details. So I start with the main piece, which is the top of the door. Um, and I'm just putting in the shape of the wood. Here you can see that I'm making some of the deeper shapes into the wood using the uh, clip curve tool. And this is really good for creating nice sharp flat edges. And then I start to draw in the, the grain of the wood using a uh, one of the two non-standard brushes that I use on this project, which is Orb Cracks and AJ Polish. Orb Cracks is the one that I'm using to do the lines in the wood right now, and I'll also use that to do any slashes in the wood that I want. And AJ Polish is a modified hard polish brush, and I use that to make all the little dints and shapes around the edges of the wood. Both of these brushes are free to download. Just search for AJ Brushes or Orb Brushes. Um, and they come with a lot of other brushes as well, and they're all brilliant. So this video is sped up by roughly 10 times um, in its 28 minute long video, but the model actually took around 6 hours. Now if I wasn't recording, a model like this would take between two to five hours, uh, depending on how many little details and little extra pieces I'm modeling with it. So although this is a time-lapse video, I still have the original files and would be happy to provide them if people were interested. Having a sped up file is good for the intermediate to advanced, but for beginners, it's not very easy to tell what's actually happening. So here I'm starting to sculpt the shape of the skull in. Uh, the, the, the skull needs a lot of work to get it up to a nice shape. I need to be aware that the underlying base mesh doesn't differ too much from the, the final sculpt. Um, this is because we're going to be projecting this in Substance Painter and if the base mesh and the high poly mesh differ too much then the projections aren't going to work. You'll end up with clipping on the high points and the low points and the edges of the sculpt won't line up with the edges of the base mesh. Here I'm trying to make the lock look like it's hammered metal and I've just gone over the whole thing with a clay brush to, to make little hammer marks and then I mask the peaks and smooth the rest. Now here on these metal straps I get the same effect but this time I use a brush from the Orbs brush pack. Uh, again you can find the Orbs brush packs for free online. Just search for Orb and um, this is a hammered metal brush. 
and it's much faster than doing each uh, hammered shape by hand. Okay, uh, here I want to add a few extra little nail heads to be projected into the normal map. So first of all I append a cylinder and sculpt it into the shape of a nail head. Then add that to an IMM brush through brush and create. I have not had much experience making IMM brushes so I struggled to get them to paint onto the object that I wanted the nail heads to be on in the right direction. So I would paint one, adjust it to the direction I wanted it to face and then duplicate it across that side of the model. As these details will be projected down into the normal map and will not be represented in the actual mesh of the model, it's important to make sure that none of them stick out too far, otherwise they will be clipped within the projection cage in Substance Painter. So at this point I'm just going around to all the different models and making sure there's no details I've left out um, and everything looks nice. The next step is to merge everything together and then Dynamesh that. Once it's Dynameshed and the file isn't too big, I try and aim for around about 1 million. Um, you can then export that Dynamesh out as an FBX or an OBJ. And so then it's time to start baking the mats in Substance Painter. So open Substance Painter, create a new file and import your low poly mesh and then in bake mesh maps set the size of your me your um, baking map down to about 512 this allows for quicker bake times and it's sufficient to be able to have a look around your mesh and make sure there's no errors the errors that you're looking for are clipping areas um, stretch mesh areas like what you see on the screen there I had a problem on this corner and um, any kind of black spots or anything that could indicate there might be a problem with the unwrap or the high and low poly positioning. I also had an issue with the smoothing around the top lip of the main coffin. Um, the inner side of it is a 90 degree angle and was set to smooth and it was just too much for the um, the normal map to handle and was causing errors so I went back into Maya and hardened those edges along with a few others. So back in Maya I create a new layer and add all the low poly objects to that layer and then I create a second layer and import my Dynameshed mesh. Then with both layers visible I select each object both the low and the high poly and position them ready for baking. So the reason I'm doing this is there's some objects here that I don't want to be completely exploded. For example, the metal straps along the top of the coffin I wish to interact with the wood. Uh, by interact I mean when we bake the ambient occlusion I want some of that ambient occlusion to land on the wood from the metal. In that way we get some areas that when we use smart materials or when we use uh, generated masks we can use the ambient occlusion between the metal and the wood to add dirt and other stuff procedurally. If we were to leave the mesh exploded and bake it that way then there would be no ambient occlusion between the metal and the wood so Substance Painter would not know that these two objects interact therefore we would not be able to get any um, rust or dirt or any kind of dust build up between the procedurally and it would have to be painted in by hand. Back in Substance Painter I import my new low poly mesh with the issues I found in the last bake repaired. Once I'm happy with the bake I set the size to 2k and the anti-aliasing to 4x4 and all the other settings um, to as high as I feel necessary for this model and then bake it. Uh, check over the model and make sure that there are no errors. In this case, I was pretty satisfied. There was a few places where there were some seams throwing, so showing through, but for the size of the model and the um, the application, like the size of the texture, I thought it was um, sufficient. Also, in a lot of cases, seams and stuff will be hidden once the thing's actually textured. Now that I'm happy with the bakes, I can begin the painting process. I start with a folder named after the material I'm about to make and then I put a base layer in there which is the base colour and the base roughness and then on top of that I add a map to break up the values. Now this map is a texture 
and it's one I painted in Photoshop and it is simply a square, a 2K map full of paint strokes. And this is because this is a stylized model and I want it to look painterly without actually doing any painting. So this paint map breaks up the values of the um, base colors nicely and adds a little bit of extra detail in there. Next, I add a blue layer with an edges mask and a bit of grunge in that edge mask. And this is because I want the wood to look old and slightly petrified and worn out and the blue contrasts nicely with the wood. Next, I add two edge masks with um, a lighter color. The first one is slightly blurred and the second one much more crisp. And this really helps to bring out the details in the model. I had a couple more layers bringing out any of the details that I've sculpted in. Uh, whenever I add a new layer with new detail, I set it to a bright color so that I can see what I'm painting in as the contrast of the bright color helps with clarity. Then once I'm happy with the mask, I can set the color to the desired shade. Again, I run through the same process for the metal. I make a new folder called metal and add my base metal and then building up on top of that uh, edge masks, um, lighter colors for the top edges and um, slightly lighter colors for each dint in this metal. If you're struggling to get the look that you want, use reference, look up on Google at various different types of metal to give yourself a better idea of, of what the result should look like. Next, I add a subfolder in the metal called rust and first of all, build up the rust color. So a nice orange for the base layer and on the second layer, I add a noise map and change the blending mode for that so that it breaks up the value of the rust. And then the whole group, I add a smart mask to that. And um, I, I go through a few different smart masks in this one, trying to decide what I like the best. So uh, a lot of this painting, I'll just try and use a smart mask if I can. And then if I can't find something that works, I'll create a generator and make my own mask. But there's no point making my own mask if there's one already made that will work just as well. The rest of my texturing process is pretty much the same. Once I'm happy with each individual material, so this is wood and metal and bone, I then make a, a layer on top of all of them and build up a moss material. And I build up that moss material the same way as I do the rust and I add that to the whole um, of my assets. And this is because I'm, I'm going for a theme that fits in with a level I'm making and uh, everything else in that level has a little tiny bit of moss on it. So this just kind of unifies it and brings it all together. And the final texture I put on top is a dirt material. And the dirt is very subtle and just has a little bit of visual noise to the smooth and stylized look of the models. Once I'm happy with this texturing stage, I export the models using the UE4 um, standard export mode. And this results in three maps, a albedo and a normal map and a roughness occlusion and metallic map. So here back in Maya the final step is to put the low poly back together again and this involves all the exploded pieces that we separated for the texturing and sculpting uh, process to be placed into the final positions and also things like bolts and nails to be duplicated around the model and put um, wherever the original plan or concept dictated. I then arranged the various assets into a diorama type pose. This is because I'm going to be rendering it uh, as a portfolio, portfolio or beauty shot in Marmoset. So I want it to be displayed nicely. And then in Marmoset, it's simply a case of dragging and dropping the FBX into the scene and any changes that you make to the FBX back in Maya will automatically update once saved in Marmoset. So there's no need to re-import anything into Marmoset. Um, it will just update automatically. 
Hooking up the textures exported from Substance Painter is pretty easy. The normal map goes into the normal slot and the albedo map goes into the albedo slot. And the last texture is roughness, metallic and ambient occlusion. Change the reflectivity to metalness and add the map to the blue channel. The ambient occlusion needs to be added to the red channel and the reflectivity or gloss needs to be added to the green channel. Next, you want to make sure that all the maps have sRGB turned off except for albedo. And then finally, you need to invert the microsurface gloss uh, section and turn on flip Y in the normal map settings. Here you can see that I'm adding another coffin to the diorama and I'm using a pedestal or a little bit of pillar from one of my other tutorials uh, to stand it upon so that we can have a full shot of the coffin as well. Uh, my lighting setup is pretty simple. I have two cameras and I use one to um, stay locked off for the final image and the other camera to move around and add lights to the scene. I add a fill light and a couple of edge lights. I also have a nice soft toned skylight, a HRI map in this scene, um, just to add a little bit of variation to the reflections and some nice fill. Here you can see I'm just tweaking the various lights and the colors so that they catch um, the different parts of the model and show off the details nicely. Once I'm happy with the lighting, I run through the render settings and the main camera settings, turning on stuff like high res shadows and local reflections and GI, bloom, ambient occlusion and um, image effects like vignette. The final stage in Marmoset is to go to capture and image settings and change the sampling to 100 times or more if you want but this will get a nice smooth render and smooth out some of the jaggedness in the shadows and the noise from the lighting. And that's one way of creating a game ready coffin model from start to finish.